Now let's move into our first main stage plenary, a moderated dialogue on the future of sustainable development. The conversation will be led by Serena Ibrahim, the founder of and executive director of Youth Against Corruption. The first, let's hear from Leo Jinmin, Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, United Nations, and the Honorable Mr. Vile Skinari, Minister for Development Cooperation and Foreign Trade of Finland. Mr. Jinmin, over to you. Excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank the International Chamber of Commerce and the United Nations Global Compact for the excellent collaboration with my department, UNDESA, on SDG Business Forum. The theme of today's opening dialogue is the future of sustainable development is the most timely. This fall, DESA is organizing, together with UNDP, a series of policy dialogues on the future of the world. The theories will aim to advance our common preparedness for future challenges and crises, reduce risks, and make our systems more resilient. I invite all of you to take part in these dialogues and to read the related policy briefs that my department is making available online. Dear colleagues, as we approach the end of the second year and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, with millions of lives lost and unprecedented human and economic tolls, what have we learned from our analysis so far? Let me share with you. We know that the pandemic has pushed around 100 million people back into extreme poverty in 2020. There was an increase of 161 million people facing hunger in 2020. We know that the pandemic has not only forfeited and reversed progress in health, it, it also poses major threats beyond disease itself. About 90% of countries are still reporting one or more dis disruptions to essential health services. We know that the pandemic is adding to the burden of unpaid work of women. We know that there is a risk of generational catastrophe regarding children's learning and well-being. We know that people in low-income households and the informal sector, as well as the poorest and the most vulnerable groups, have been disproportionately affected due to their specific health and socioeconomic circumstances. We know that the pandemic has sped, sped up the digital transformation of governments and businesses, profoundly changing the ways in which we interact, learn, and work. We know that despite the pandemic halted economic slowdown, the climate crisis continued largely unabated. Even with a temporary reduction in human activities, which resulted in a temporary dip in emissions, concentrations of greenhouse gas emissions to increase in 2020. Human activities are also causing biodiversity to decline faster than at any other time in human history. Sustainability of oceans is under severe threat. Extrification, overfishing, and pollution are threatening the livelihoods of over 3 billion people relying on these vast and essential resources. Dear colleagues, as we head for towards the future, what we should keep in mind. To address the deeply rooted problem that have been laid bare by the pandemic, we need to make major structural transformations and develop common solutions guided by the SDGs. First, we need to urgently ensure universal and active access to COVID-19 vaccines and treatments. Second, we need to significantly strengthen social protection and public services for all, from healthcare to education, from water to, and sanitation to energy and to trans transportation. Third, we need to strengthen the care economy to ensure no one is left behind. Fourth, we need to increase investment in data, in science, technology, and innovation, and to create physical space in developing countries to address 
that distress. We need also need to accelerate development on a low carbon and green path, including by investing in clean energy and industry. Lastly, we need a unified vision of coherent, coordinated, and comprehensive responses from the multilateral system. Earlier this month, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres presented his visionary report, Our Common Agenda, to the General Assembly. The report set, sets to chart a path towards a more equal, resilient, and sustainable world in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, including a reinvigorated multilateralism. The report calls for deepening of solidarity between people as well as with younger and future generations based on a renewed social contract, one that is anchored in human rights as well as an up updated understanding and a more effective engagement management of the critical global commons and the global public goods. Dear colleagues, the future of sustainable development depends on, on us, on the choices we make today. Let us work together for a greener and a safer world for our children and grandchildren. Let us see the, the moment to ensure that this decade of action, transformation, and restoration is to achieve SDGs. I look forward to hearing what our distinguished panelists have to say today. I thank you. Excellencies, dear participants, it is a great pleasure to address this year's SDG Business Forum. The government of Finland is very committed to implementing the SDGs at home and providing funding and expertise for the achievement of the SDGs globally. Our priority is to help build better business environments, create sustainable jobs and promote innovations, digital development and green transitions in lower income partner countries. As a Minister for Development Cooperation and Foreign Trade, I see this type of public-private collaboration as the only way to achieve lasting, sustainable results. The triple nexus of development, humanitarian aid and peace operations can create a three-legged stool that appears solid but doesn't dare leaning on it with full weight. Trade is a fourth leg of a sturdy chair. However, much work remains to be done. We face a huge financing gap in achieving the SDGs, a gap that the COVID pandemic has unfortunately and dramatically increased. The public and private sectors must form a bond to create new game-changing capital flows. This would in turn mobilize private investments at scale especially for those countries most in need of financing and action. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2019, Finland set a target of becoming carbon neutral by 2035. From there onwards, Finland aims to be carbon negative. It is an ambitious goal, but one that we must meet. Carbon neutrality will not happen by itself. We need to work hard. We need to work together. Production and consumpt consumption patterns need to change. We need innovations, incentives and smart regulation. We will also need new e economic measures such as carbon pricing and dismantling of fossil fuel subsidies. In this context, an important global initiative is the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action, co-chaired by Finland and Indonesia. The coalition aims to bring climate change to the center of economic policy and financial markets. Promoting carbon pricing is one of the coalition's key goals. 
There are already 60 countries in the coalition representing 63% of the world's GDP and some 39% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. I invite all countries to join. Dear friends, in Finland we have learned that innovative solutions are critically important in solving challenges of sustainable development. Innovation has been a priority in Finnish development cooperation for almost two decades. Social innovations are also important. For instance, school meal programs are the most widespread social safety net in the world. In Finland, we have our own strong experience demonstrating that the benefits of school meals, for example, for learning, go far beyond a plate of food. Finland is also a proud host country to a growing number of UN technology and innovation programs. These include the UN Global Pulse, UNOPS S3I and, in the very near future, two UNICEF innovation hubs focused on innovative financing and learning. Sustainability has been an important part of Finnish businesses for years. Finnish companies have been very innovative in creating, for example, environmentally friendly climate solutions. We are glad to share our experiences with you all. Circular economy is one key solution to the climate crisis. Finland was the first country in the world to prepare a circular economy action plan in 2016. I am convinced that the world needs a transformative leap to circular economy. Dear friends and colleagues, thank you once again for having me here today. Sustainable development is our common mission. Yes, it's difficult, but not impossible. Let's work together. I wish you all a very successful event. Thank you so much. Secretary General, Your Excellencies, members of the international business community, I'm extremely pleased to welcome you to the discussion on the future of sustainable development with three very distinguished business leaders who I'm very happy to introduce in just a few minutes. They say that there is nothing stronger than an idea whose time has come. I say that there is nothing stronger than a global shift in consciousness and actions whose time has come. A drastic shift in behaviors among local and global private and public sector actors is crucial at this time because, as we all know, the world is not ready to pay the cost of non-action against climate change. Yesterday was the time for sustainability to become everyone's business. Today is the time for stubborn optimism, for serious commitment to Agenda 2030, and for a high value and high impact actions to be taken by everyone everywhere. It's with great pleasure that I would love to introduce our three speakers for this discussion. Mrs. Sandra Wu, Chairperson and Chief Executive Officer of Kokosai Kogyo, member of the United Nations Global Compact Board, board member of Global Compact Network Japan, and member of the Advisory Committee on National Resilience to the Cabinet Secretariat. Thank you, Mrs. Wu, for being with us. Mr. Magnus Billing, CEO of Electa, a company that provides occupational pensions for more than 2.6 million people across Sweden. Before joining Electa, Mr. Billing held the position of Chief Legal Counsel and Senior Vice President of NASPAT Group. He is as well Chairman of the Board of Directors for Stockholm Sustainable Finance Center. And finally, I would love to introduce Mr. David Gregg, 
Senior Advisor at London Stock Exchange Group. He's the co-chair of TNFT, Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure, a global initiative that was founded in July 2020. He's, uh, he is as well founder and former CEO of Refinitiv, one of the world's largest providers of data analytics and technology to financial markets. Mr. Greg, I would like to start by asking you the first question. Do you truly believe that sustainable development should become every organization and company's business, no matter its size and scale? Why is, is business as usual not an option anymore? Well, thank you, Serena, and, and thank you for um, the honor of being on this panel today with my distinguished panelists. Um, I think the short answer is yes, I do believe. Um, we are fast realizing that climate uh, and nature uh, are not separate issues. They're actually core to the fundamental economics of all companies and business, irrespective of size, geography, and shape of what they do. Um, if you think just about the, the dramatic events on our TV screens almost daily, floods in New York, floods in Northwest Germany or China, intense wildfires in Australia or California. Um, just a few examples of the natural disasters. These are really rare, raising awareness, but also having direct impact to business. And, and these disasters don't discriminate large or small businesses are all impacted. Uh, measured direct losses from natural disasters have increased three times in the last 10 years to around 300 billion, but that's the tip of the iceberg, the indirect loss and risks we are just starting to quantify. Uh, not just from the extreme events, but um, from the impact these events have on our economic activity um, and the impact that they're having on our natural ecosystems and biodiversity. And, and if the events themselves weren't enough, it's estimated that every six seconds, the world is losing a football pitch equivalent of primary rainforest. In my lifetime, we've reduced wildlife population by 68%. The World Bank estimates that under business as normal, we'll remove another 46 million hectares of natural land by 2030. And in the sea, the estimate that 66% of marine environment is severely affected. Uh, so business as normal and carrying on is not sustainable uh, as we're not factoring in these externalities to everyone's business. The WEF estimates the economic risk of natural systems is 44 trillion. Uh, Banque de France recently estimated that over 40% of French banks' portfolios come from companies with high or very high dependency on ecosystems. So these are real and material risks from the continuous degradation of the natural ecosystem that is not separate, but the core and the heart of business activity and market activities. It's at the heart of our food production, our production systems and our energy systems. Um, and our own data shows a major shift in financial flows now directly going to support sustainable business, to support natural transition. And it's not just coming from the big companies making those big promises, but also the vast, vast number of hundreds of thousands of smaller companies as well. And, and just to finish on that, it's not just the big announcements from the big companies that do make a difference. An example that was in the FT today, the UK supermarket Iceland, made lots of small changes adapting to more efficient freezers, turning off the store's illuminated signs, um, changing their floor planning, and they cut carbon by 74% in doing so. So it's not always the very large businesses that do this. In fact, it's the smaller business and a lot of small things as well that really make a difference. And I, I don't think it's an option. We have to change business as normal. These issues are at the heart of business and economy. Thank you so much. Uh, Mrs. Hu, is there anything that you would like to add? Any additional th thought to what, uh, uh, after what was said by Mr. Greg? Okay. Oh, yes, Serena. First of all, thank you for having me here today. I just want to add to what the David said. Um, I also think it is important to know that we have come to a point where a single business cannot create a safe space to operate by themselves because environmental issues are no longer a local limited issue because we are dealing with more extreme, more frequent and the global scale events due to the climate change. And issues of labor and human rights also transcend borders because our supply chain are now global. We are all affected by the reckless decision, both business and political, made in countries far away. So we are, all, we are in this together. The private sector must understand that we thrive only when the community around us in, 
it's thriving as well. So we really have to do all this together. Thank you so much. Mr. Billing, we would love to hear from you as well, why business as usual is not an option anymore. Thank you, Serena, and, and thank you for having me on this panel. It's a great privilege. Um, just adding a couple of com comments to what uh, was earlier mentioned. I, I think it's important also to, to uh, acknowledge that there is a lot of companies out there today that are actually transforming their business model in a, in a more sustainable way. Uh, uh, operation mood, and I think that should be encouraged. Uh, however, I think these companies will uh, need the support for, as Davos was talking about, internalizing the externality, and that support will need to come from the policymakers. And, and one such concrete example that we heard earlier today was the, the need for carbon pricing. Uh, and just to give a concrete example from, from, from our Electra point of view, if we look at our portfolio and we do stress testing uh, on the portfolio in its entirety uh, to ensure that it's aligned with the Paris Agreement, we can clearly see that there's substantial uh, uh, depreciation of the value relative to the market price today. Right, So uh, we are seeing a situation where businesses are operating in the uh, environment which is not uh, considering all the cost of the operations to produce the value to the shareholders. And I think that needs to be addressed. Um, so that's one point. And then I think, yes, business as usual is not an option, but I think one should be a little bit uh, cautious also about the uh, importance of just transition here. Uh, just take the European context, for example. It's very dependent upon small and medium enterprises and the value creation that is coming from them and the job creations that are coming from them and the innovation coming from them. So it's important that the regulatory flood that is coming today in order to make a more sustainable environment, it's good, but it needs to be balanced to also what kind of company are we targeting, what kind of capacity does that have, and what kind of important study played in order to secure a just transition going forward. Thank you so much, Mr. Billing. On that, can you give us cases or concrete examples on how ELECTA had meaningful impact and contribution to Agenda 2030? And what trigger, like what triggered this change of behavior? What triggered uh, this uh, shift and like strong contribution to sustainability? Well, thank you. I'm happy to. Uh, so maybe if I may start with the, your question regarding the trigger. I mean, we are, as you mentioned, an occupational pension fund, and we have the, uh, the benefit of having uh, extreme long-term liabilities on our balance sheet. So we're talking 30, 40 years down the road. Uh, for us, that has meant that we have we see this as an opportunity uh, to to uh, basically manage the matching risk in the balance sheet and capture the opportunities that this transition of the world will bring with it. Uh, so that's just one starting point. The second one, which is maybe more even more uh, clear and, and and coming through very with a very high voice, that's the uh, end beneficiaries clear demand on us to manage their money in a sustainable manner and in a responsible manner. Uh, so that ties directly into our fiduciary duty to, to manage the, the capital in the way that end beneficiaries want us to do that. So uh, we, uh, just to give you a couple of examples of where we enter into the impact investing and, and, and very clearly towards the SDG goals, uh, we have partnered with the World Bank, IFC, uh, national development banks uh, to invest in emerging markets uh, with specific SDG goals uh, uh, targeted. And one example is that we invested in the first African social bond, government bond uh, issued by the Ivory Coast in 2019. We have invested in a loan fund uh, together with M M NMO, the Dutch National Development Bank, targeting small and mid-sized enterprises in emerging markets to support uh, their business development have also invested into a social bond targeting uh, health issues uh, in the emerging markets as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. So those are a few examples of where we uh, enter into impact investing. Now, just to give you or to end with a couple of comments on 
the criteria or the, the important features that are important for us to address to address and access this kind of market. It, it is uh, to start with a limitation on our side to to understand the markets that we invest into, in, in particularly in emerging markets. Uh, and therefore, we need to have uh, a partner uh, that have this know-how and capacity. And for us, it's been very constructive and valuable for us to work with the World Bank, the IBC of this world. And I think uh, we can do more to leverage those kind of uh, organizations to uh, attract and employ mainstream capital as pension capital and insurance capital. And I hope we will see more of that going forward. That also enables one other thing, which is extremely important for us when we invest, and that's scalability. Uh, given the size of the capital we manage, we are looking for you know, possibilities to allocate large amount of capital towards the SDGs. And I think, again, the multinational development banks and the national development banks can be an enormous catalyst to support that mainstream capital towards the SDGs. Thank you, Surya. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing with us your work and the actions that you have been taken. Uh, Mr. Sanja Wu, uh, my question for you is, in your opinion, what are the biggest challenges that are facing the transition towards a more responsible and sustainable private sector? Yes, yes, Serena. Thank you for the question. Um, we all know that the rate of change of our society and technology is getting quite overwhelming, and it's becoming very hard to forecast and predict. Also, with the globalization, a single business can no longer create a safe space to operate by themselves. And while ESG management and investments going mainstream, there are still many business out there who prioritize short-term profits and the investors who reward such decisions. And in this context, the challenge for businesses is to, first of all, predict the future, which is necessary for long-term planning. And secondly, to see the long-term plan through. Everyone now knows that the ESG management and the investment will lead to long-term growth as well as long-term profit. But I think many business leaders are still not quite convinced. And this leads to treating ESG and the sustainability as fashion. It's just a new way to package things. If this is the approach taken, then there will be SDG washing and concern over ESG score rather than true improvement. So our biggest challenge is to convince the very large number of the business out there still not taking action or just doing SDG washed. We need to convince them to think and act differently. That's the challenge. I think that every business leader should go back and think about the roles and the responsibilities of the private sector, where our responsibility to society is to provide goods that better the society, while also ensuring that we do not harm it through the running of our business. We also have responsibility to our employees who need to make a living and to our shareholders and investors. To do all this, we do need to think about short and long-term profit. A business acting responsibility is not the same as business acting altruistically. The idea that a business can or should ignore the profit angle to work on sustainability alone does not make sense. And having an ESG or sustainability plan that is not fully integrated into our into your business strategy also does not make sense. To me, it is clear that the only way for business to stay relevant in the long term, to ensure our value remains high, to deliver to all our stakeholders, is to make sure that we are addressing sustainability through our main business activities and through the products and the solutions and the services we provide. And by ensuring our mode of operation from worker rights to resource use follows ESG and the sustainability principles. It takes a lot of time, money, and the labor for a business to change direction. And all signs are pointing to accelerating change around us. I think we are not worried enough about whether we can keep up if we decide to transform sometime in the near future. We need to start thinking and acting differently right now. 
Thank you, Mr. Zhu. Um, concerning that, we are not worried enough. Uh, my final question to uh, all of you is what could be done to notch organizations and businesses around the world to worry enough and on the urgency of taking concrete adaptation and mitigation actions against climate change. Mr. Greg, we would love to start with you, please. Uh, yes, thank you. So the question is, what, what can be done now to, to, to nudge organizations? And I, I think we need to um, encourage, nudge and push. And the previous panelists talked about some of the things that regulators and government should do. Any crisis is an opportunity. Um, this is not just a challenge, it's an opportunity to invest, uh, not just the drive to become net zero, but also in nature positive solutions. Nature and climate are two sides of the same coin. But we have to invest in skills and expertise as well. Um, you know, this far into the climate crisis, still only around 20% of companies report on their carbon emissions. Is that because of incentives? Maybe, but also because of skills and capabilities. So one of the things we're doing in TNFD is focusing on capabilities at the start. How can we build the skill sets that understand the nature-related risks and dependencies that companies have? Um, and even before carbon tax or tariffs arrive, I think companies should ensure they are pricing carbon um, and where they can pricing nature dependencies into their models. Because I think running those scenarios, understanding those risks ahead of a price for carbon will redirect capital into the right way and make the risks that are external become internal. And that's incredibly important um, to do. So making sure that ahead of regulatory frameworks coming that, that companies understand the nature related risks and the climate related risks and impacts they have is something that can start to be modeled um, now. Um, and I think raising awareness and education back to my first point um, on sustainability and climate and the need for more natural solutions um, to these things. So in short, I think we need to make sure that as we, we race to net zero, which is a race that on, we need to be racing towards nature positive as well. We need to bring those externalities um, into internal measures in our organizations. We need businesses to be aware of their dependencies on natural ecosystems and climate and start to model those in uh, and start building the skills and capabilities because that's where I think the biggest gap is. There's lots of people making a lot of big statements about these areas, but actually when you get underneath the surface and find the expertise that really understands how to model these to put financial investment into them, it's actually not that many people at the moment. And that's where I think we need to focus. Thank you so much, Mr. Billing. So, what's the question to me, Sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, so what could be done to not organizations and businesses right. around the world on the urgency of taking concrete actions? Uh, Sorry, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So uh, I would just echo what David just said about the importance of internalizing the externalities. That, that's one thing, and, and, and that maybe two, two points. I, I think uh, uh, we are today uh, struggling a little bit with the, uh, the reporting of the data on this, that the progress has been made and, 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 and good progress has been made. Uh, but uh, I think we're still in a position where there's room for improvement on reporting on this and also getting you know, standardization on indicators for actual impact vis-a-vis -vis the SDG goals. Uh, that would, uh, I think, uh, bo both highlight and clarify for the institutional investors uh, what uh, impact their allocation is having vis-a-vis -vis the uh, SDG goals. And, and that is important because as I started off with earlier today, I, it's clear that the, the end beneficiaries demand on the institutional capital is, is I would argue, strong uh, and supported of more capital allocated to the, towards the SDGs. So that would sort of connected two dots there. Uh, the second point I would like to, to, to raise is, is what uh, was also earlier mentioned about the importance of long-termism. And I think we, we as an institutional investor have uh, room to improve when it comes to stewardship. Uh, we are very focused today on, on, on uh, corporate governance matter that is more micro-oriented. I, I think uh, one way of improving this is to take a systemic lens towards it and, and there also capturing the SDGs and the Agenda 2030 and, and also push those kind of issues into the boardroom and to the 
executive management team of the different companies out there. Thank you so much. Mrs. Sandra, uh, we would love to hear from you as well. What do you think should be done uh, to raise awareness and to launch organizations around the world uh, to take climate change more seriously and to move to more concrete uh, actions inside their organization to push for Agenda yes. 2030? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sharina. Obviously, one company taking concrete action will not achieve the 1.5 degree world. So we must take uh, collective action and work together. So globally, we are one of the 14,000 businesses signed up onto the global compact and putting the 10 principles in actions. And we also signed up the climate ambition for 1.5 degree. And locally, we are part of the Japan Climate Initiative, a multi-stakeholder group with private sector, local government, and the civil society members. We, working, we work together to, to amplify our action as well as our message. So we need to work together as we are doing now in this hashtag uniting business. Thank you. Thank you so much. So to wrap up, today we have heard from Mrs. Sandra Wu, Chairperson and CEO of Kokosai Kogio, Mr. David Craig, Co-Chair of TNSD, and Mr. Magnus Billing, CEO of Alaska. Uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you today. It was a pleasure learning from your experience, your thoughts, your idea. And thank you for sharing with us your work. Uh, dear audience, I hope you find this discussion useful, enriching and inspirational for you. Thank you for joining us. And I wish you all a good end of forum. Thank you. And thank you, Serena, for leading us in such an insightful discussion about the future of sustainable development. And thank you to the panel for sharing such important perspectives on these issues, both the risks and, importantly, the opportunities.